Hello everyone, happy Friday and welcome to Sip and Stitch. If you're new here, my name is Carly Bell and I love to get together with y'all to do live machine embroidery tutorials from start to finish that we call Sip and Stitch. So it's been a little while. This is our first uh, live tutorial for 2024. So hi everyone, happy new year. Um, I hope you've had a great start to your new year so far and that you're all doing well. So let me check the comments real quick. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Can we start 2024 off with no technical issues? That's a really big, a big thing. So good morning, everybody. I see Brenda and Sandra and Luis and Jamie. How's everybody doing? Um, I also see Dawn's here from Creative Appliques. So she is the, she's the spotlight of today's show is her design. So thank you, Dawn, for all of your wonderful creations that we love to make at home. So hi and thank you to her. So hey, everybody. OK, good, good, good. I'm glad y'all can hear me. <laughs> so um, first off, I want to apologize for any of y'all that showed up earlier. When I made everything for today's live, I was physically in California. And normally I like to do my lives at 10.30 um, a.m. Central Time. But apparently 10.30 a.m. when I was in California means 12.30 p.m. <laughs> Central Time. So sorry for the mix up. It actually worked out for me because I was not ready this morning. So when I saw, actually Dawn uh, from Creative Appliques texted me this morning and brought it to my attention that the time was wrong. I was like, Okay, I'm gonna leave it alone because that that works <laughs> that works out better because I wasn't ready this morning. So I apologize um, if you got mixed up this morning by the by the time, but I hoped that giving you a couple extra hours worked out in your benefit as well. So hello, hello, I see Sherry's here. Okay, so I hope you're having a great start to your new year. I had a very slow start to my new year. I um, we had. A bunch of sickness going around and then Louisiana all of a sudden decided it wanted to freeze um, and go like in the 20s which never happens here so lots of fun things been happening but the really thing I think that kicked off my new year was getting to go to the impressions expo this past weekend which is located in Long Beach California which is why I was on California time for a little while um, and that was an amazing experience that I'm gonna tell y'all more about more about while we're stitching, um, but absolutely incredible. A uh, big thank you to Sewing Machines Plus for um, giving me the opportunity to go out there and work in their booth, which was also, it was a, a Sewing Machines Plus slash brother embroidery booth. So I also, I got to work with some of my favorite um, brother ambassadors and educators that I always watch on Facebook. Um, so I got to meet them in person. So that was really cool. But uh, lots of fun things I want to tell you all about the Impressions Expo. But like I said, let's get stitching first. Um, so today's project is a Valentine Valentine's Day project. And Dawn at Creative Appliques makes these adorable little mini quilts. And I've been having my eyes on these for a while, like on my to-do list of things that I want to make. So I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to make one for Sip and Stitch. So I chose the Valentine's Day uh, mini quilt. So if you can see, this is what we are going to be making today. And I got this cute little stand off of Amazon that I think I have linked for you in the description box. But this is the one that Dawn uses and recommended. Um, and this is the valentine's day mini quilt she also has mini quilts in other um, holiday themes as well so you can, if you enjoy making this one today you can go check out her page and see all of the other fun holidays so you can 
constantly rotate what's hanging in your stand so that it, it goes with whatever season it is um, or holiday that's going on around you. So super cute design. Um, so this is what we're going to be making today. Uh, a few pointers I want to tell you before you start. So um, if you're not stitching with me as I'm going live and just watching or watching the replay later, um, the design comes in three different sizes, but you need to purchase the size that you want to make. So purchasing one does not give you all three sizes. You need to make sure you're purchasing the one that you actually want to stitch at. So what I'm showing you today is the six by 10 design. It also comes in a seven by 11 option and an eight by eight option. All three of those sizes can be displayed on this stand. Um, I think the eight by eight one is, it comes up a little short, like right here. Um, I saw, I think I saw a square stand on Amazon, but I couldn't really tell how the mini quilt would look on it. So if I end up ordering that and stitch out the eight by eight, I will let y'all know how it looks. But I figured this stand would accommodate all three sizes, but I like the six by 10 the best um, for it. The seven by 11 would be just a little bit bigger. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's thing number one is you wanna make sure you purchase the right size. Number two, Dawn was very kind to give us a coupon code. So you can use the coupon code Carly, just spell my name, K-A-R-L-I-E. And that is going to give you 20% off of your purchase, good through Valentine's Day, February 14th <laughs> um, of 2024. So you can use that coupon code if you wanna go ahead and grab this one and grab an Easter one or whatever holiday um, is next that you celebrate. Um, so that you can make a few little quilts to go in your stand. And then, as I mentioned, the stand itself is on Amazon, and there's a link for that down below. There's also a link for all of the sizes of the February um, mini quilt in the description box below the video as well. So you can jump on that and get there. And then the coupon code's written down there as well in case you forget. Okay, um, Deborah asks, does it come in five by seven? No, but this was something that Dawn was asking me if I thought would be a good idea. So there you go, Dawn. Um, you got some feedback of people want to see some five by seven mini quilts too. I think that would be cute. I think it would still work on the stand as well. Um, it would be a bit shorter, but we, we're going to talk about the hanging piece today and how we can accommodate that depending on the quilt you're making. So, uh, I think a five by seven quilt would also be very cute and would work on that stand as well. All right. And as Dawn was saying, the coupon code is good for everything. So 20% off your purchase. So while you're there, go shop around. Um, she has some of my favorite fonts, really, really cute fonts, cute applique fonts. And of course, appliques in general, like for every holiday and um, event that you can think of that you would want to make uh, something for cute for kitchen towel designs, adorable for children's um, clothing and baby clothing, but all kinds of fun stuff. So yes, big thank you to Dawn. All right, and Susie said, do you have a link for the stand on Amazon? Yes, it's gonna be in the description box below the video. So on YouTube, I think right under where the video is in the title, they'll have some writing and it says, see more. Click on that and it will expand and show you everything. I think it's at the bottom, but I will double check after the video and make sure it's it's very visible and you can see it. Oh, it's not in there. Okay, Marina, I made a boo-boo, let's see. Okay, you know where it is? It is on the Sip and Stitch homepage, which I can put here. Okay, so if you just go to my website, carlybell.com, um, there is the, in the menu at the top, it says sip and stitch. You could click that and go to the homepage on there. I know for sure I put the link to the stand. <laughs> I thought I put it in the video description. I'm sorry if I didn't, but yeah, sip and stitch homepage. That's your resource for everything. That's what, that's the page that I really take my time on and put everything that I can think of that I'm using with YouTube. I don't know about, yeah, with Facebook too, they give you like a limit of, of how much you can write and you can't go over it. So that's why I don't always get to put everything in the description box, but on my website, there's no limit. So I can put everything on there for you. 
All right, yay. Okay, and Jamie's excited. So today I am going to be using my brother NQ1700E. And that's a mouthful of a model. But the way I classify, um, especially my brother embroidery machines, is by the max hoop size. So if you have a brother embroidery machine and your largest hoop size is four by four, then the brother machine I started with, the max hoop size was five by seven. Those models were PE 770, then PE 800, and now it's PE 900. So you see where the numbers and the letters can get a bit confusing. So I like to think of the embroidery machines, classify them and group them by their max embroidery field. So the one we're using today has a max embroidery field of six by 10. So I look at this one as a step up from our five by seven machines. And so we get a much larger hoop with the NQ1700E. Before that was the 1600E. Before that, I think it was the 1500. <laughs> um, and they make sewing and embroidery combo machines that have the same hoop size. So look at your machine that you have at home and determine what your biggest hoop is. Um, and that's going to help you with grouping uh, the kinds of machines that I show you um, tutorials on. Because pretty much everything I show you, you can make on any machine. What's the limiting factor is the hoop size. So for today's project, the smallest this design comes in is six by 10. So you will need at least a six by 10 hooped machine or bigger in order to make this project. Um, if you're one of my uh, persona or um, uh, PR1X uh, friends that have the free arm single needle machine and have the eight by eight hoop, actually the persona has the eight by eight hoop, um, you can make that eight by eight uh, mini quilt because you won't be able to make on the persona, you won't be able to make the six by 10 or the seven by 11, the eight by eight one is your option. But um, like I said, I think we're giving Dawn some good feedback today and show her that we do have friends that want a five by seven mini quilt as well. So she can maybe look into um, to adding some of those designs to her site. All right. Yep. Haley's saying, I've been eyeing the uh, 1700E. <laughs> Tax time is coming. Yay. <laughs> I know I have so many friends that are like, what am I going to get myself with my tax rebate? <laughs> and then lots of my friends are like, I'm paying for my children's tuition <laughs> with their tax rebate. Uh, but I know that's a nice thing um, to have when you get it. But this was the machine that I looked at when I had my five by seven PE 800 machine. This is the one that I wanted to upgrade to. So let me show you what it looks like. This one. Okay. So this is the machine. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can see. So it's much, I have my PE 800 on a shelf, but I can't get to it right now. So it's it's a bit longer than the PE 800. And the main thing is the embroidery arm is a lot bigger so that it can accommodate the much larger hoop um, to stitch out on this machine. So it's, it is a bit larger if you're coming from a five by seven machine. It's, it takes up a bit more um, space and it has a much larger embroidery um, arm. Also, if you're coming from the PE 800, the other nice thing about this machine is it cuts jump stitches, whereas my old 5x7 machine did not. A little bit larger screen as well, and it stitches a bit faster. My old machine stitched at, I want to say 650 stitches per minute. This one stitches at eight or 850. Let's see, eight, 850 stitches per minute um, is the max uh, speed on this machine. So this is what we're working with today, but let him, let's see, I think I have a link for the machine down below. Um, and as always, I tell my friends, if you ever um, are interested in buying a machine, I, um, have a salesperson that I work directly with at Sewing Machines Plus. Her name is Jean, and this is her direct phone number with her extension. Um, if you give her a call and tell her what you're interested in, she can help you out, answer all your questions, tell you about financing, and also help you get my discount if you're getting any accessories to go with it. So give Jean a call if you're interested in getting yourself a new machine at tax time. Um, and she can help you out and just make sure you tell her that Carly Bell sent you. And 
if you can, if she can apply my coupon code to any of the items that you're buying um, to help you get the best deal possible. So talk to Jean. Okay. Now let's get started with everything we need for this project today. All right. So I am at my craft table and I have my six by 10 hoop and I have a piece of cutaway stabilizer. Favorite thing about in the hoop projects is the only thing that we need to hoop is stabilizer. No worrying about figuring out placement or, you know, whether we're going to stitch something crooked or not. All we got to do is hoop the stabilizer. Let's see. I think I need to loosen this up. I also like the, the hoops on this machine is a bit different than the ones that was on my five by seven machine. Um, the, the part where you tighten it is made nicer and that it can swivel right here. It's amazing. Like the simple little things that make a really big difference is the swivel. Also, all of the hoops on this machine versus the smaller four by four and five by seven, they slide on versus those brackets that have given me trouble in the past with sometimes the hoop popping off the embroidery arm while stitching if it wasn't attached correctly. This one, you can't mess up your hoop popping off while in the middle of stitching because it has a slide on and it has a little lever right here that makes sure the hoop stays in place. So another nice upgrade if you're going from a smaller four by four or five by seven machine, when you get to the six by 10, some nicer hoops um, come with it. Let's see, Shannon acts. Here we go. Can we use some poly mesh cutaway? I think so, Shannon. You may want to use two layers of it. Dawn specifically recommended a cutaway and that she thought it helped. Oops. Let me get the stand. Um, it helped the quilt be a little stiffer um, so that when it's hanging like this, it hangs nice and straight. So this was Dawn's recommendation to use a cutaway. Um, however, if you don't have any cutaway in your room, I think two layers of no-show mesh would suffice as well. Because I've done other quilting in the hoop projects with poly mesh came out, came out fine. All right. Let's see. Oh, Norma. <laughs> <laughs> Norma, next on her list is the multi needle waiting on FedEx to deliver a new. Oh, you got a heat uh, auto heat press. What kind did you get? Um, too bad my husband home can't sneak it by. <laughs> I know that feeling, Norma. I'll try to sneak things around Chris all the time. But yeah, tell me what kind of heat press did you get? All right, let's see. Um. Oh, okay. She said it right here. She got the HTV Ron 15 by 15. Um, I've heard this one's good. Um, so let me know how you like it. All right. So we have our cutaway. Now let's talk about all the things needed to make the mini quilt. And one beautiful thing with your uh, purchase of your design is you're going to get some very, very nice instructions with it um, so that you can see step by step what you're doing. Um, I, I like the visual uh, watching people, but it's also nice when you're doing it to have a paper um, reference as well. So you're going to get this with you. And one of the things that is on the first page is exactly the cut measurements that you are going to need for all of your fabric pieces. So the first thing we are using is you can use some batting um, or you can use fusible fleece. So I have a piece cut for that. The next piece you're going to need is what is going to be the front of your quilt. Let me take mine off the stand so it's easier to show y'all each of these. Okay, um, so whatever fabric you are choosing to be the front part of your quilt. So I have that. Then personally, I think something that is simple for the, the front middle, maybe with a small print, not anything too busy. 
and then use your fun busy prints for the border. So you see I had this fabric um, that had some hearts in it. So that's what I chose for the border. And you're going to need four strips of fabric for that, two for the, the top and bottom, and then two for the sides. So like that. So you're going to need that. All the measurements are in the description for you, depending on which size mini quilt you purchase is going to depend on what your cuts are. Then you are going to need a piece for this hanging part at the top. Okay. Now this is where I think having a nice visual to watch is going to help you because there are options for you. In the instructions, the options describe a piece that not necessarily hangs from the top of the quilt, but is more situated on the back of the quilt for the rod to slide through. And this is what it looks like when it's finished. If you could see this little tab here at the top, um, this is what the paper instructions are showing you how to make. In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to make the hanging one if you prefer that. I think it looks really good with the six by 10 and the eight by eight option. The only thing with the seven by 11 option is because your quilt is going to be longer, but only an inch longer, um, you may just wanna make it to where it's not as tall as mine is um, so that your quilt, your mini quilt is not hanging like too low um, on your stand. But I really like this hanging option, and I'm going to show you how to make that today. So that is one of the cut pieces. So you can, even though we may not be following the written directions with how it's made, I'm still cutting it to be the same size as what the written directions say. So for my 6 by 10 quilt, I need 5 and a half inches wide by 3 inches tall. So that's what my instructions say that's still what I'm going to do. I'm just going to add it to the quilt when it's stitching in a different way. So still cut the same size of direction, say. So that's going to go up here. Then because we have, we actually have two pieces of applique, you can use whatever fabric you want to fill the applique. I went with a glitter option today. Um, this is not actually glitter HTV though. This is like a piece of canvas glitter I got from Hobby Lobby and I cut the um, the piece out <laughs> where it says what it is. But the, you can buy like sheets of, of glitter canvas from Hobby Lobby and it like, it's almost like glitter fabric. Um, you can also use heat transfer vinyl, glitter heat transfer vinyl. And of course you can use regular cotton woven fabric, um, whatever you would like to fill your 14 with. If you are going to use some fabric, I highly recommend you put some heat and bond light on the back of it um, and then iron it before we do the satin stitch. So I'll try to remind you of that before we get to that step when I would use the heat and bond light. But you need your fabric, whatever you want to fill your 14 with. And then the last bit is the back of the um, mini quilt. Now, I wasn't quite thinking when I was cutting my fabric, it, it, did, it doesn't look bad at all. But in my head, originally I thought I was gonna do the hearts so that when this goes around, it all looks like one piece of fabric. So if you would prefer that look, cut your back pieces to match your border and your hanging bit. Of course, your hanging bit doesn't have to match your border. You can have, maybe it would have looked cuter if I would have did this pink as the hanging um, portion and just did the hearts for the border and the back. But it, you have lots of options. You, you know, your creativity um, can guide you as to what you wanna use for what pieces. But you will need two pieces on the back. And what's gonna happen is when we get to that step, we're gonna end up folding those pieces to create an envelope um, to cover up the back. So that is all of the fabric cuts between the fabric and the fusible fleece that you're going to need. 
And then, of course, I have applique scissors. I have tweezers. I have my good fabric scissors to cut it out when we're done. Um, I have this bag point turner I got from Clover. Helped a lot when I was turning this right side out. And for the part of making the, the top handle the, to go on the, the stand, I use, you can use something called steam and seam, which is like an iron on double sided tape. Um, I thought I had some in my craft room. Turns out I don't. However, heat and bond light works just as well. <laughs> so I have some pieces of heat and bond light that I'm going to use to create my, my, um, edges here on the hanging bit of the quilt. So heat and bond light, steam and seam, or of course you can just take this to your sewing machine and stitch a line down the end to, um, to make your uh, seam here. All right, I think that is everything. Any questions on the supplies? And then we'll get stitching. Okay. Let's see. I see Cindy asked a question about machines. So let's talk to Cindy for a second. Okay. What machine would I recommend if you currently have the Baby Lock Alliance and would like a bigger hoop with a smaller size machine? I'd like to do sweatshirts, perfectly piece, and Kimberbell quilts. Um, if you want to continue to do sweatshirts and, and garments, I definitely stick say you stick with a free arm machine like you currently have, the Baby Lock Alliance is equivalent to my brother um, Persona. The only limit on that machine was it only had an eight by eight hoop, right? Um, the next step up is actually the newer model that they came out with. The Baby Lock version is called the Capella and the brother version is called the PR1X. And it's basically like the machine you have now. However, it has an eight by 12 hoop which is perfect for adult size sweatshirts and backs of jackets. It gives me that large hoop like my multi-needle has, but I'm still working with my single needle machine. So if you're trying to keep your budget on the lower side, I'd look at the Baby Lock Capella or the Brother equivalent. Um, and then if your budget is a little bit larger, I would go for the six needle. Um, I forget what the Baby Lock one is called. Array, I think. And then the brother is the PR680W. I have that machine and love it. So there are some other upgrades on the Capella and the PR1X, but the main big feature is they increase the hoop size, which is which was huge. So if you want to stick with almost the same machine you have now, but have a larger hoop, that would probably be your best bet. Okay. Yay, Julie says Dawn has great instructions. Yes, she does. And she will appreciate that because we were talking this morning about how hard it is to write all those instructions. <laughs> all right, let's see. Okay, Marina says, what is the biggest size of Dawn's mini quilt? Um, so I, I think all three sizes fit on the stand. Um, Dawn has pictures on her website of all three sizes on the same exact stand. So you can see what it looks like. Um, with the three different sizes and, and determine in which size you think you want to stitch out if you have a hoop that can do all three. Um, I like the way the, the six by 10 looks. The seven by 11 is going to be a smidge wider, so it's going to get closer um, to these rails. So I think that one would also look great. Now the eight by eight is going to be more like this, but wider. So you're going to have this space at the bottom. So I think a square stand would look better with the eight by eight version. Um, but I think six by 10 or seven by 11 looks great with this one. Um, okay. All right. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and get started. So I have my hoop with just my cutaway stabilizer. So let's go to the machine and start stitching. Um, the first placement stitch. So like I said, these hoops slide on versus the bracket and there's a little lever here that you press down and there's instructions right here on the embroidery arm so you can't mess that up. I do already have the design loaded on the machine. So this 
is a type of design that's ready to go. You can purchase it on the website, download it, unzip the file, which I just double click on my computer. You may have to right click and hit extract all if you're on a PC. Once you've opened it, you just want to go and grab the PES version. If you're working with a brother or a baby lock machine, if not use whatever format your embroidery machine um, takes and just copy that onto a USB stick. Or if your machine has the ability to send designs wirelessly, you can do um, that as well. But you just upload it to the machine and it's ready to stitch out. You don't need to do anything in brilliance with this. I can't personally think of any customization I would want to make to this. Um, I think it's great just as is um, so that you can use it again every year to decorate um, your house on the little stand. So really just upload it to the machine and it's ready to go. The first stitch is going to be the placement stitch for the batting or fusible fleece. It does not matter what color thread you have for this step. I have red loaded, so it's easy for y'all to see. So I'm just gonna lower my partner foot and hit go. And while that's stitching, we can talk about your option of batting or fusible fleece. I have fusible fleece um, in my craft room and you know one side is we've got the the adhesive on it and one side is just soft. Um, in the instructions they talk about how if you put it with the adhesive side up this is going to allow you for your next piece of your quilt to get ironed um, down to the fusible fleece so that everything is nice and smooth. So that is an option for you. Um, my first quilt, I did it with the fusible side down and I had no issues because one thing you, you can remember is there is some quilting that's going on top of this step. So even if it's not completely smooth after it stitches, the quilting is going to even everything out and make it look nice. But you have either option, nothing, neither way is wrong. You can do it however you like, either the adhesive side down to, to adhere it to the stabilizer or the adhesive side up to adhere to the material that you're stitching on. So I'll do, since I did the other one down, I'll do this one up. But you're just going to put your piece of fusible fleece on top of your stabilizer and just make sure you're, cut, you're covering up the placement stitch on all sides. Once that's done, you can lower the presser foot and do a tack down stitch. Uh, another upgrade, I think, from the 5 by 7 machines is you have a presser foot up-down button versus on the smaller machines, you have to go and lift it in the back. So that's nice having that button there. Also, I like the needle threader better on this machine than my 5 by 7 machine because whenever I push the lever on the side to thread the needle, you'll see when I change thread colors. Um, it automatically lowers the presser foot um, for me so that I don't mess it up like I've done on my five by seven machine. <laughs> All right, so once this step is done, you're, you are going to want to go trim this outer edge just like an applique. So we're going to take this off and go back to the craft table and trim. All right, so red thread helps you see that stitch line. And I'm just trimming this. Not doing a very good job of trimming this. <laughs> All the way around. Make sure I'm not missing any questions. Let's see. Um, Shannon X, is the red side panel wide enough to do any kind of quilting? I 
to me, I think it might be too thin. Um, if you wanted to pre quilt, um, the edges, I don't think it, unless it's a really, um, small pattern, I don't think you'll really notice it. Cause like I've done that with the sashing on some of my little quilted things I'm making with, um, me time. I still haven't finished it. My December one, <laughs> I could show you where I've gotten. <laughs> um, but no, I think it's a little too thin to, to worry about quilting those border pieces ahead of time. Okay. So this is trimmed now. Nope. Wrong piece. Here it is. Um, we're going to go back to the machine. I think it's going to, let me see, let me check my steps. This is where, when I start second guessing myself, it is nice to Okay, so there's no, so after we've done trimming this, we are going to lay our, whatever is going to be the center main fabric for your mini quilt, you wanna lay on top of your fusible batting. And we're gonna stitch it. And th then there's gonna do a tack down stitch on here. So just lay, this fits perfect. If you cut it the way the instructions tell you, um, this is going to fit perfectly right on top of your trimmed um, batting or fusible fleece. So I'm going to go back to the machine. And stitch this tack down step. I'm still using red thread, which is fine. I think I'm going to change after this step, I'm going to change, you want to change to the color of the actual quilting that you want. Okay, let's go back. And now we're going to trim this just like we did the fleece. Here we go. All right. And you'll see this is set in a little bit. It might be hard to tell, but it's set in a little bit from the fleece or batting. I'm supposed to trim this, right? No, I'm not supposed to be trimming this. I knew I'm doing something wrong. Okay, leave that alone. <laughs> Forget I did that. Um, yeah, it's okay. Well, now what I'm, I'm glad I put the fusible side up. Okay, so now that we have this tacked down, um, we are going to be um, pressing. Did we do trim this? Yeah, I'm not crazy. I thought I remember trimming this. Okay. Because we did the fusible fleece going up, we can adhere our, um, with the adhesive going up, we could adhere our center fabric to it now. But the thing you want to remember is you want to keep your iron inside of this box. You don't want your iron going on the outside. So I have my little mini iron. And now I'm activating that adhesive on the fusible fleece and staying inside my box. And then I guess it doesn't matter which step you trim this particular piece. We can trim it now if we want or we can trim it after the quilting bit. So since I already started trimming it, I'm gonna go ahead and do it now.
And by doing this, we're just reducing the bulk that's going to happen when we turn this right side out. After it's done stitching, you'll see what I'm talking about. And see if my iron touched a little bit over here. I guess it's good to wait to trim till after your iron so that your iron doesn't accidentally touch that um, adhesive part of the fusible fleece and mess up the bottom of your iron. That's, that's the whole thing where you want to make sure you're staying inside this box because you don't want to mess up your iron. Okay, now I'm going to change my thread color on my machine because it's going to do just some single line um, quilting, straight line quilting. So I'm going to use this cream color for that step. Okay. And then you can see the difference in the needle threader on this machine versus my PE800. I am still using a thread stand over here on the side. With all my flatbed machines, I do like to use a thread stand um, better than the, the built-in thread holder. So I am going to use this red later. So I'm going to put this here. Ooh, and then while some stuff is stitching, i got to show you what Norma gave me, her husband made. It's great for projects like this, where you have multiple thread colors on a flatbed machine. Okay, so I am doing the normal thread path. That's going to be the same as other machines. So I have my thread path. Now on my smaller machines, I have to really take care to make sure I lower the presser foot before I thread the needle. Because if I don't, the needle threading mechanism will hit this and bend it and cause your needle threader to not work. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Um, <laughs> with this machine, I don't have to worry about that because when I do this, it automatically lowers the presser foot for me. So that is a really simple but nice feature that helps out people like me that forget things. <laughs> so the needle threader I find is a bit of an upgrade from your, your smaller machines. Okay, now that I got my cream thread on, I could lower the presser foot and now we'll do the, the straight line quilting. Got some pieces. All right, let me check. Okay. Uh, Delcy, Carly, I love how you film and that you don't hear the sound of your machine while you're talking. Yay, good. I'm glad that, that the sound is good for you. That's what I upgraded uh, my microphone a few years ago, and I, that made a world of difference. So I'm glad that the sound is good for you. Yeah, because I know, I, I think the first time I did a live, and as soon as I turned my machine on, one of the ladies like, it sounds like a machine gun is going off in your craft room. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, Susie has a good question. When is the Embrilliance workshop or is the is online course is going to start? Hopefully next month, Susie. My life has been uh, not going to my schedule recently, so it's got a bit pushed back. But my goal is to have it up um, and ready after we have Mardi Gras here in New Orleans, so at the end of February. But I do have a wait list if you haven't already signed up. So what she's talking about is I'm, I'm working on my next online course, which is going to be all about Embrilliance Essentials and how to use that program. And I have a wait list if you're interested um, in this kind of course and want to be notified as soon as it's open. Um, you can click on the link below for the wait list, and then you'll be the
the first person emailed once the course opens. Okay. Oh, I, I, I saw a people, a couple of people comment on my nail color. I like my nails. I don't know if you can see, but I got Mardi Gras nails. The, uh, this is a new thing I discovered at my nail salon, but they have this kind of like metallic powder. So they paint just like normal black nail polish and then they press this metallic powder on top and it gives this, it, it to me, it looks like a balloon, like a Mylar balloon, but I, I love it too. So thank y'all. <laughs> I will tell um, the lady that does my nails how much I liked it. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. <laughs> All right. We're done with the quilting. Okay. So now is when we start putting the sides on. So I'm a, you don't have to take it off for this step, but I think it will be better for y'all to see if I take it off and come over here just to make sure y'all see it better. All right. So here's my hoop. Here's the part where it attaches to the machine. So the first step is the long sides. And my first one, if you can tell, this is how it is. My first one, they're going in the same direction. This one, I'm gonna, ch I'm gonna change it. Like one set of hearts going that way and one set of hearts going this way. But you have to put it, let me get the right pieces. You have to put it right side down and you're folding it in towards. And we're using, Let's see, which line are we using as a guide? Okay, we're using this line here, right on the edge of our, my inner pink fabric. That is your guide. That's what you're lining your fabric up to. So I got my, let me see, can I turn it? Can you see that? Yeah, this is better. Let's turn it this way. All right, looking at my hoop, I want it to look like this when it's stitched. Like these hearts are going this direction and these hearts are going this direction. So line it up how you want it to look when it's done, then turn it inwards. So right side down and this edge of your fabrics lining up with the edge of your pink here. So like that. And then, you know, make sure you got some extra at the top and bottom, but you're lining lining up here. All right, this is how I want it to look when it's finished. I'm gonna turn it down. Okay, so right side down, I'm lining up with this stitch line here. I got extra at the top and bottom. So that's it. I didn't find I needed to tape anything in place, but if you are worried about this moving while it's stitching, just use some paper tape or um, some people even use scotch tape. I used to use like masking painter's tape, really light tack tape. Um, and I, I also love the Kimberbell embroidery tape. So this is how it's gonna look. If you can see, now we'll go back to the machine. All right. Now this step, it doesn't matter what color you use to stitch it um, because this stitch is gonna be hidden once we turn things the right way. So I'm just going to leave my cream colored thread on and it's going to go down here and then it's going to go up here. And while that's going on, you make sure your little iron is on. Like mine likes to turn off when I don't use it. So make sure your iron is on while that's stitching. So it's getting hot when you're waiting for it. All right. So now it's going to do the other side. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I, I see um, Coffee Alley um, talking about a full size iron. Yes, when you're doing, I love to have a mini iron with all of my embroidery work because it could, I mostly use it for applique, um, but there are some in the hoop piecing quilting type projects where I use my mini iron um, because you do, you want something small that's gonna fit in your hoop. My tiny iron fits in as small as a four by four hoop. So it's great for all size hoops um, for projects like this and especially applique projects. All right, so let me turn it this way. So I have that stitch line going there. So now you wanna bring this back to your craft table on your wool mat 
and now just pull those over and now we've created our border so you see my hearts are going in the direction I want now um, heading out like that and use your little iron this is a Cricut one um, I've also used like a travel size iron now when I'm ironing I got to make sure I'm not touching this little white border up here with it because that is my fusible fleece that still has the adhesive side going up so be careful of that when you're using your iron and do this make sure I don't get and then I can just kind of press that nice it's weird how the red fabric turns like a dark dark red when you iron it but then it goes back all right so that is pressed and ready while it's on my table now we're going to situate our top and bottom pieces so again i'm going to line it up how i want it to look i think i want it like this the hearts all go in in an up direction i don't know if you could see so like those are there those are there um i see that's what i want and now i'm going to fold this one down use this line line it up i'm gonna fold this one up use this line to line it up okay and then we're going to do the same thing so let's go back to the machine see sometimes happens when you put it on things get caught so pay attention that nothing gets caught in your presser foot everything looks good and i'm gonna leave the same Again, thread color doesn't matter for these steps. Um, okay. Coffee Alley says, has Embrilliance come out with a version that can be fully utilized on an iPad? No, they have not. And I do not foresee them doing that anytime soon. It would be nice, but I don't see it. Um, they have something called Air Stitch, but... I, to be honest, I haven't really used it. I think it mainly just lets you visualize an embroidery design on your iPad. It doesn't let you do any editing. It doesn't let you, I think, even send the design to a machine. Um, so no, there's no iPad friendly version of Embrilliance um, yet. It'd be nice if they made it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath on that. <laughs> I'm just happy they have it to where it works on Mac because it seems like no other program in the world that I like for crafting works on, on Mac. <laughs> um, okay, we have these two stitch lines. I'm gonna do the same thing now. We're gonna fold these down and iron them. And now we're gonna use this little piece of fusible fleece that's exposed here and that's gonna fuse our, our fabric. Okay. All right. So now everything is done. Let me check. I want to say next is going to be all your pretty embroidery on the inside. No. Next is a tack down stitch right around the border. No. Um, yeah, it's a rectangle. Okay. I'm trying to see. I must, I did that step in red on this one. That's going to be your outer. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I see it now. I'm trying to remember what color I did. I think I left that with cream. Yeah, I did it with cream too, because it's not going to be seen. It's kind of like out here. And that's going to that's going to serve as a placement stitch later for the top piece. So put this back on. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, so it's gonna do like an outer edge outline and everything's nice and pressed in place. And then we're going to do all our applique steps. All right. So the next step is going to be your one and four applique pieces. I'm doing it with that pink glitter. So I'm gonna go ahead and load some pink thread um, just so that y'all can see it better for the placement um, and tack downs stitch. But for normally, because this is a satin stitch finished applique, it doesn't matter what thread color you use for the placement and the tack down. Okay, again, I can thread the needle and now it's gonna do the placement stitch for the one. Now, because the numbers, the one and the four are separate as far as tack, uh, placement and tack down, you could do them in different fabrics. However, I believe the satin stitch is one step for both of them. So they would have to be outlined with the same color. But if you wanted to fill them with different fabrics, you could. Um, when I did my first one, I, oops, I went ahead and skipped a step and went to the four placement. And then I just placed this piece over the, the whole thing. Um, however, it's set up so that you can do one at a time. This does help a little bit with trimming so that you can trim the one out before you do the four. So that's what I'm gonna do for this one. And I am just placing this right on top of this, the placement stitch and just making sure it covers up everywhere. And now this is going to tack down my glitter fabric and the outline of the one. And that's what I'm gonna use as a guide to trim it and, um, and cut it out. Okay. Okay, so now you wanna take this off the machine and go trim out the one. So now, now probably would have been better if I would have kept the cream colored thread on because then you can see the stitch line better. But I can, the camera probably doesn't pick it up too good, but I can see it in person. But sometimes I do this to myself. I use the thread color I use is very close to the material I'm filling with and it makes it hard to see. I'll do the next one with cream so y'all can see it better. But I'm just stitching as close, I'm cutting as close to that stitch line as possible without actually cutting the stitch line. If you do nick it, it's not a big deal. The satin, the, the satin stitch that happens after this will prevent you know, tack your fabric back down if you did snip any of this on accident. Okay, back to the machine, do the outline of the four, and then we'll do the same thing, cover up the four with this. And I will, just for y'all's visual to be better, I will change back to that cream thread so y'all can see.
and I'm just using my thread stand off to the side of the machine here. Okay. Next step is outline of the four. Song two. Nope. I'll fix it after. Man, I love Shannon's comment. She says, um, I am a needle threader snob. <laughs> I needed I needed to auto thread via a button. Um I I can tell you that my I had the baby lock Altair and now I have the brother Stellaire. And that has turned also turned me into a needle threader snob because it is a beautiful thing when the, it's the simple thing of instead of a lever, it's a button, but the actual mechanism of the needle threader is beautiful on both of those machines. So yes, I can definitely see where it can turn you into <laughs> being a little bit bougie, <laughs> like in your needle threader. Okay, so now it's hard for you to see the placement stitch of the four. I can't win, uh, but I'd much rather be able to see the tack down stitch because I need that four. Um, is that wide enough? That looks wide enough. Let me cut these little pieces off. So it's barely wide enough. So I'm just making sure. Oh yeah, it's more than wide enough. Okay. Okay, covering up my placement stitch. Now we're gonna stitch out the four. These little pieces won't use. Hi, thank you so much for trying to make the link Hi, Erica. Let's see. Um, Earth is asking if does anyone have the little steadfast iron that was recently recalled? Oh, wait, is it this one? Steam fast? I didn't know this one. Is this the one that was recalled? I did not know, Ursa. Let me know. This was my first mini iron. It's like a travel size iron I got from Amazon or Walmart. I can't remember. Um, and then I, I got the Cricut one because it has the auto off feature. So I do have that iron if that's the one you're talking about. I did not know it was recalled. I will look into that. All right. I'm biased on YouTube says the fabric is beautiful. Thank you. I love this stuff. This is just like glitter on, on canvas. It's almost like a glitter canvas fabric. And I got it from Hobby Lobby. It comes in like sheets, eight and a half by 11 sheets that you can get. There we go. All right. Now you can see the outline of the four and see that a little bit better to trim. So that's a little bit more visual <laughs> than using the pink thread. Like on the one, you can't see that pink thread as well to help you easier to, um, a little bit easier to trim. But on the four, we got something tricky going on. I'm gonna show you. So now I got to save all this for some more projects in the future. So you just want to try and trim this as close as you can. And then all this raw edge is going to get covered up with a really pretty satin stitch. So if after you're done your project, if you are seeing your fabric poking out on the outside of the column here, that means you need to trim a little bit closer. 
Now the satin column on this design is nice and wide, so it helps. I like when you, for appliques like this, I like that the, the, the thickness of the column is nice because um, that really helps from seeing little imperfections like cutting close enough. But sometimes when people first start applique, they're, they're scared to get close to the stitch line. And that's when you're going to see it outside of that satin column. All right, now with the four, we have a hole. And there's probably no easy, straightforward method to this. I'm just going to show you what I do. And I'm going to hold it close so you can see. But I take my scissors and I try to poke this fabric and make a little hole twist it like that. And I usually can feel that I've gotten through just this top layer and then I pull it up to make sure I'm not also getting my pretty light pink fabric underneath. I don't want to cut a hole through that. So I'll do that and snip and then I'll kind of look in it, make sure I'm not snipping my pink fabric. I can see my pink fabric there and just kind of make yourself a hole and then you can you know open it up and see my pink underneath and then go around and trim it like a regular applique but it's like creating that little hole double checking yourself that you're not accidentally cutting the fabric underneath um, can be a little tricky but just keep practicing. The more you practice, the better you get. This is especially nerve wracking when you're doing these kind of appliques on a shirt because <laughs> you're so scared you're gonna cut a hole in your shirt. But there we go. Nice, got that hole out of there. All right, so from this point on is just a lot of um, satin stitching and just, changing the, the needle, um, changing the thread on the needle. So I'm going to set that up and then we can talk. I wanted to tell y'all about the Expressions Expo and everything. So now the next is the satin outline for the 14. I do want that to be in the pink color. So I'm going to put my pink thread back on. And then set that up. Down and go. All right. While that's going, Sandra said, could this be the time when we make our sides larger if we wanted to by cutting wider strips? Not necessarily because where the stitch lines are for both this side and that outer, um, it, that's what determines how wide your strip is, not how much fabric you're cutting for it necessarily. Let's see. And uh, Norma asks, and I think I'm behind on comments. Sorry, I'm going to scroll down more. My vertical strips of fabric were, I think, two inches wide. Yeah. On the six by 10 hoop, these, when I had pre cut the fabric, it was two inches wide. Um, Tracy asks, can you use batting instead of fusible sleep? Absolutely. Plus, you don't already answer that for you. Oh, lunchtime's over. Okay. Um, I'm behind on time. Jeez, I'm way behind. Let me scroll all the way down. Okay. Um, Mary has a good point. Can you use your seam ripper to start the hole in the middle uh, for the board? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it possible to cut the hole beforehand in the form? Yes. If you have an electronic cutting machine, like a silhouette or a scanning cut, 
you can pre-cut these numbers on those machines. And there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, or if you have a brother scan and cut, you can literally just open the PES file of this design and just go and select the placement stitch step for the one and the four. And you, what you do is you increase it a smidge, uh, an offset. So it's a little bit bigger all the way around because you want it not necessarily to be the same, the cut line to be where the stitch line is. You want it to be a smidge bigger. Um, so you press the offset button and just increase that by I think a millimeter or two. Um, and then you cut the fabric and you lay it down right after the placement. You'll still have the placement stitch to show you right where to put your fabric and you just make sure it falls in there. Um, if you have a silhouette cutting machine, if you upgrade to the business edition of the software, you can open up PES files and do the same thing. Um, if you have in Brilliance Essential software, you can open up this design in the software, select the one in the four, and when you go to the colors for it, you can, there's an applique option and it can create an SVG cutting file from the placement stitch, kind of same principle that it's going to enlarge it a smidge just so that it's a little bit bigger than the original placement stitch. Um, and then you can take that cutting file and go to your machine with it. So three different options for you there. Uh... Oh, and Dawn has a really good option too. Um, for the center of the four, so like, say I was, I think this was what she's saying. So say I was placing my fabric and I could kind of use a pin and see right where my hole is going to be and then snip a little uh, hole in my piece before it does the tack down stitch. So then you kind of have a pre-cut little hole in there before you start. So there's another option for you too. Okay, and here's another point. And in Brilliance, make sure you are selecting the placement or tack down stitch for the numbers, not the satin stitching. Very true. Okay. Um, Carolyn says the glitter canvas fabric, if it's, it's in, no, it's not in the fabric area, it's in the craft area. Yes. Okay, ooh, Dawn knows about the recall. Uh, the recall involves the steam fast brand travel, steam irons, model numbers, those. Um, they're printed on the back of the irons and it's printed on the white iron. Let me check mine. Okay, what do I have? Model number SF727. Yep, that's me. <laughs> I don't use it anymore, but I guess now I'm really not going to use it anymore. Betty X, what scissors am I using? I use, these are called embroidery snips and they're made by a company called Havels, H-A-V-E-L-S. And I got them from Sewing, Sewing Machines Plus. And I do have the link for that both down below the video and on the Sip and Stitch homepage. Um, I always have a link for my scissors. I'm going back. <laughs> okay. Oh, Haley doesn't have that one. Good. Um, oh, and Sandra's going to check hers. It's in the camper. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was one. I don't know what the recall is on, but I would, um, I'm guessing probably a fire hazard um, because it, I mean, it doesn't have auto shut off. I would think any iron without auto shut off, but they're just not all made with that. 
but I don't know what the fire hazard is. Maybe it's uh, the recall is probably something with the cord. But the whole reason why I got away from that iron was because I left it plugged in for several days in my craft room <laughs> one weekend. And uh, the, yeah, that scared the bejesus out of me. So I was like, I need a mini iron that has auto shut off. So that's when I got the Cricut. And I want to say the new Aliso um, iron has auto shut off, the mini one. I guess the, the other one didn't have it before. Uh, okay, great. Phyllis says we can go over their website, fill out the requirements, and either get a new iron or check for $19.99. Okay. Thank you. Yes, voluntary recall. Okay. All right. While that's, that's almost stitching, let me show you something we were talking about. Sorry, I'm all in the way. Um, this is my December perfectly piece project. This is quilting in the hoop. You can see. So this is what 18 inches by 18 inches uh, finished. I still have to bind it. I'm scared to death of binding. But all the quilting was done in the hoop just like we did here. Um, and then I pieced together the four blocks and then the sashing and the border. Now this border was wide enough. I don't know if you could tell. If I hold it this way, you see the little, they have like a ribbon quilting on here. So this was wide enough to quilt, but I did not quilt the sashing with skinny, which is, that's about the same as what the border is on this quilt. So that's what someone was asking about if it was wide enough to quilt. Um, these pieces, I don't think, but this was how wide. Um, this was that I was able to quilt, but it's hard to see on the camera. The lighting is not quite right, but you can kind of see it there. But I need to finish this. I need to bind it. Let's see. What's the other thing I want to show you? Oh, okay. So on a project like this, you see my, my threads, like these are threads. This, this one only has a few threads, but I want to shout out to my friend Norma Bates and her wonderful husband. They he made this for her and she, she, he made several of them for her and she was kind enough to bring me one at the impressions expo when I was there. But this is a board that has pre-cut holes. And then on the bottom is a piece of dry erase board. Okay. So you could put it, and this is a beautiful thing to hold your threads and you can put them in order. And this, this particular board has one through 12. And I, she gave me a marker that I've already misplaced. I'm sorry, Norma. I put it somewhere um, where I can write on here. So say step four repeats um, here, and then I have more colors. I can write cream in here, or I can write use, you know, thread number one repeats here and then keep putting more threads after. So it's like a little organizer. It helps you keep your thread colors in order. So thank you so much for that, Norma and your husband. Um, so I wanted to show y'all that. And then I don't think he's taking orders, right, Norma? <laughs> to buy. So if other people want some, but I do have another option for you where, where I think um, they got the idea from. That is a place you can order from if you like something like this. If you have a single needle machine and you like doing projects with lots of colors, um, these little boards are very helpful. Right, I'm putting my gold thread on now for the writing February. Let that stitch. Okay. So I got this from a company called Laser B Studio. Laser B Studio. So these are cut right here. Okay, so they have the numbers engraved on them. So one through 12, and then this one is 13 through 24, so up to 24 colors. And you can place your threads in them. And like I said, say if step number four was the same color as one, 
I can go and write one um, in there and then have this in front of my machine and have all my thread colors in order. This is from a company called Laser B Studios, and I'll try to remember to go put a link for that um, after the show's over, if y'all like that. Yeah, okay, or please, Norman, have your husband teach my husband. <laughs> I think it was pretty simple. They went and bought a nice piece of plywood. I don't know what kind of wood this is. Um, he got a special bit. I want to say she, he got it from Harbor Freight, if I remember her telling me the story, that goes into your, your drill, and it's a little, like, circular saw, and it came with a set with multiple size circles. So you found the circle that was a little bit bigger than the bottom of your spools, and he cut those holes using that into this wood, and then they just bought a piece of it's like MDF board that has dry erase front and he just screwed that onto the back of this and that's it and she put a piece to hold my dry erase marker but I messed it up in my suitcase it, it, it came off um but you can do something to attach either velcro um to attach a dry erase marker on the side but I think it's pretty simple your husband can make this you can get a thinner piece of of wood um if you can and yeah, just get that circular bit that goes on your drill and drill out those holes and then attach the dry erase board on the back. Does she get the dry erase board from Hobby Lobby? So this is a little piece of dry, a little dry erase board she bought from Hobby Lobby and she made this board fit it. So teach your husbands or get the drill out and do it yourself. And I think she just sanded the, um, the edges to make everything smooth. Okay, Home Depot. Circle maker, dry erase boards from Hobby Lobby. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right, so that was one thing. What was some other thing? Oh, let's see. There's a couple other tips I want to remember. I have a tip I learned from Cindy Hogan. So keep continuing with the Impressions Expo. So I met Norma at the Impressions Expo. She brought me this, and she also brought me two beautiful pieces of, let me get my goodie bag here. Oops. She got me some vinyl. So I got some rainbow cork and some like rose gold cork. Beautiful stuff from Sweet Pea. She got at another embroidery show. I love, I can't wait to use that. Let's see what else I got. I got, I'm gonna try out a new thread company. They had a stand at Impressions. They're called Candle. Can you see that? Candle um, embroidery thread. They sell the big giant spools and they sell little ones too. And what I am excited about is they had these at the show for you to take. Look, look at the thread color options. They have literally every color thread I could possibly ever want in my whole life in this book it all folds together like an accordion but look at that look at all the greens and then to the tans and browns brown silvers black and then they got specialty fluorescent colors and they got rum to expand <laughs> but like look at all those thread colors so I love this and that I have it in person so when I'm doing a project and I'm like, man, I wish I would have had a little bit of a paler yellow, I could come look on here and be like, this is the color I'm looking for and then order that particular color. Um, I wanna say they might've told me not every color comes in the small spools, but it does come in the large. Um, but this is some, I'm gonna play around with it. If I like this thread, I'll let y'all know. Um, and then find out where they sell it. I think it might even be available on Amazon. I think they told me. All right, so February is done stitching. The next step is some hearts, which I'm gonna do this one just like I did my, my other one and probably give it to my mom. Um, the next step are these three hearts. And then the step after that is the arrows. I want to, I have gold thread on, so I'm going to jump to the step with the arrows 
by using the needle plus minus button. And then I'm gonna press the spool plus. And I think that's it, I'm gonna hit okay. And I could see in the little screen here, those are the arrows. So I'm gonna lower my presser foot and go, and it's gonna stitch those arrows. Then I'm gonna go and back up to those parts at, and stitch those after. Let's see, okay, what else I got in here? They also had a Madeira stand at the, at the expo. So I got some samples of Madeira thread and this is like a book showing all their different types of threads, not necessarily all their colors, but like everything they sell. But I did get a sample pack of Madeira stabilizers. So this is kind of cool. It comes and it comes with a um, explanation of each one. So you can feel it like this is a 1.5 ounce. This is a two ounce. They have a black two ounce. These are cutaways. They have a 2.5 ounce. Um, so it's nice that you could feel them and see what they're like before you buy a big roll of something. So all the different Madeira stabilizers. So that was pretty cool to get to see that. Then what else? I got some catalogs of items to like embroider onto. So this is some hats. If Terry Osborne is watching or watches later, she does a lot of hats. Tell me if you've tried auto brand hats before. Because I've never really done much structured hats. And I got some tips at this show on how to embroider structured hats on our free arm machines. So I might try these hats. And what's cool about it is it is wholesale. So I think you have to have a business. You have to have a tax ID number. However, there's no... Uh, uh, what do you call minimum order? So if I just want to order five hats, I can order five hats. I don't have to order 200 hats. So if you are a very small business and you have a tax ID, you can order hats from them. Um, some other places I picked up stuff was U.S. Apparel. I didn't talk to them, so I don't know what the deal is on theirs, but they got lots of beautiful like sweatshirts um, we can embroider on and T-shirts. So I'm going to see about that. And then this was another shop, Nissan, um, that has like all kind of bags that we can embroider onto. So I like the clear bags, but they had all kind of fun stuff and they had hats too, um, all kinds of bags. So it's nice to, the expo was definitely geared towards small businesses. Um, you know, not, it, it's not like your typical hobby quilt show. Um, like my applique getaway and stuff is very, very different from that. This was like definitely geared towards businesses, um, whether a small business or even like larger, you know, print companies were there. They had every kind of industrial printing and embroidery machine you can think of was at the show and they were all on and working as you were walking around. So you got to see them in action, which was a lot of fun. says you're assuming our husbands are crafty <laughs> no but i would say most have a drill and if your husband don't have a drill you should get yourself a drill and use it yourself um let's see somebody asked what size is the opening i will tell you let's see that's done stitching this open it's a two inch hole so uh, a two inch opening on norma's um thread rack the one her husband made all right, so we're done stitching the gold. Now I'm going to put my red thread on and back up 
and do those hearts that I skipped. And then we're almost to the part. Maybe while that's stitching, we're going to talk about the, the hanging piece. Um, red. Okay. Now I'm hit the needle plus minus button and I'm going to back up two steps to step 14. Okay. I see the little hearts in my preview uh, window here, lower presser foot. And then it's going to jump back to where those are supposed to be. All right. Let me check the comments. Let's see. All right. So the thread company I was showing was Candle. I don't know how much it is for school. It's the first I heard of them was at this show. So I will get more info and let y'all know. I was just very excited about the thread chart. <laughs> And that I got one in so that I could see all the threads in person. Um, but yes, candle. That's the name of it. Uh, okay, Joanne says her PR100 or the persona um, loves candle embroidery. Awesome. Oh, and they're located in Sugarland, Texas. Awesome. Okay. Yay, Michelle had a half day of school. Woo. Um, yeah, circle is on the thread holder is two inches and the kit is by Miss Milwaukee, Milwaukee, which comes with different sizes and he paid only $40 for that kit. Nice. Okay, and she's going to post a picture. So if you're not in our Facebook group, come join us. Um, there should be a link down below and then you'll see what Norma's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon's cracking me up. My husband isn't crafty, but he is a woodworker and an engineer. So this would take six months because he would make sure everything was correct measurement from the other circle. <laughs> he would make sure like everything is completely and utterly proportional and square and, and level and all the things. I know my husband is similar to this and that if I act for a picture frame to be hung on the wall, of course, that would take six months. And when he would do it, the picture frame could be as light as a sheet of paper, like literally some cute little wall hangings I've done before are super thin, you know, as light as this mini quilt and hang it on the wall. He would make sure it is in a stud and it is a two inch wood screw and it can hold 75 pounds and it wouldn't move if a tornado came through our house. That is how he is with hanging things up on the wall. <laughs> so yeah, it would take him six months to do this too, because he would be the same way. He'd want everything to be perfectly proportional. I totally feel you on that, Shannon. Um, oh, this works out good. Um, Becky, her husband just got that kit for Christmas and hasn't used it yet. Put him to work, girl. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, y'all are cracking me up. Um, Oh, yeah. He, yeah. It's got to be level. All the things. All the things. He's, he's absolutely ridiculous. I got some little cute kitchen signs in the corner of my kitchen, like little teeny tiny, less than a pound, little wooden signs like this, super thin and like talk about coffee and stuff. He was so particular when hanging those up about how level they were and the spacing in between each of the pictures. And they had to be in a stud and all, all the things. He draws me nuts. So one day when he was gone hunting and my craft room here, a lot of things I want to do, I, I wait on him when he has time, like putting my cabinets together and stuff like that. It's understandable. But one time he was gone hunting and I was, I had all this cute stuff to put on the wall around my pegboard behind me where I stand. So like, let me change it. All, all of this stuff, right? He was, he was gone hunting and um, I got, one night I was like, that's it. I'm doing it by myself. And I hung, not the pegboard. He did that part, but everything else I hung up and especially these I'm proud of because these are really hard to get just right. They're from Ikea, the little spice rack. Um, these are hard to get on just right. And I got them and they're level. I use my level, <laughs> but I did all that one night. I was very proud of myself and I hung my thread racks on the wall 
and uh, on the other side of over here. And um, those are a little bit crooked, but they're fine. Nobody sees us. <laughs> but he came home and he was he was he wasn't like, oh, you did a good job. But he's like, you didn't do a terrible job. I'm going to catch that later. It's funny, funny. All right. Uh, Maria's saying her husband is the same way. Ooh, Norma said she used some pink glitter foam for the 14. I want to see that, Norma. That was a picture in the Facebook group. Yeah, and she posted the picture um, in the Facebook group, too, she said, of the, the tool that her husband used to make the thread, the spool holder. Okay, that's done. All right, now let me clean up my mess on my craft table here and let's talk about the hangy piece. Okay. I got a big mess on my table. Let me clean it up. Thanks. And most of it's clean. This. All right, now let's talk about this piece and turn my iron on. All right, so this is the piece that is gonna go through the stand. So this is what the stand looks like, and it just has a little gap right here so that you can slide this in and then slide, then you know, scooch it over and then slide the rest, right? So here is how we're gonna make that piece before we stitch it. So on the, what is this? The six by 10, the piece, the size of the piece is five and a half by three. Now turn it right side down. And all we're gonna do is fold in like a quarter to a half inch on the sides here. All right, and then we're gonna iron that in place. Let me see, I got a crease right here. Let me get out. Okay, so this doesn't have to be perfect as far as the, you know, being a quarter inch exactly or whatever. Just fold the sides in. I do want it to be like a straight line. That's the only thing maybe take some care with is that it is a straight line. Okay, so fold that in. Then, if you have, what is it called? Steam, steam and seam, um, or steam a seam, you can use that. And it works basically the same as this. So, what I'm doing is cutting some thin piece of my heat and bond light to where it's a little bit smaller than my seam. Because again, you don't want to get this on your iron. Okay, so you see how I cut two little thin strips like this? Um, now you want to iron those down. It doesn't matter if you iron it open like this or go ahead and close it and iron it, but you want to iron that. Or you can also just run this, if you have a sewing machine up in your room ready to go, you can also just go run this to your sewing machine and stitch a little line. You're just, basically you're just preventing the raw edge from showing on your finished quilt. Okay, so once you iron this, then, you will be able to peel up this paper backing, right? And now you got adhesive on this side too, and that's what's gonna make this stay down. So peel up the paper backing like that, and then iron that down.
Okay, and that's done. So now you've created some finished edge here on the end. And now you want to fold it from top to bottom like this and iron that going across. Okay, so you have that done. So when you're done, you want it to look like, like this, right? Now, let me take the hoop out so you can see. All right, so we have this piece we just made. We got our finished edges on the side and it's folded in half. Now hold it on your quilt. And if it's the directional fabric, make sure it's going the direction you want. Remember, it's going to be at the top, just like this one. Okay. Once you know it's going the direction you want, take it and fold it down. And you're using this stitch line at the top here as your guide. With this one, you want to go past the stitch line because it's basically going to stitch right on top that same spot again. So with the raw edge going up, can you see that? So the way I make sure it's going the direction I want, I lay it like this. Like I know this is what I want. Now I'm gonna fold it down, but I don't wanna line it up to where it's right on this white line. I want it to go past it, right? Give yourself at least a quarter inch going past this stitch line because it's just gonna stitch right back on top of it again. And that's what's gonna tack it down. Okay, so when it's done, it's gonna look like this. All right, so a little bit past that stitch line. Also make sure it's centered because it's not the full length of the quilt. You know, make sure you don't have it over here. Make sure you use your center piece as a centering tool and make sure that it's centered, something like this, okay? And then if you want, you could tape this down to make sure it doesn't move, but put your hoop back on your machine and it's going to pack down that step. Um, this does not matter what thread color you're using. Also, I need to remember I jumped ahead with stuff, so it's back on the gold arrows, which I've already done. So I'm gonna skip, jump ahead one step. Okay, now it's that line. Um, for me, when I'm doing things, like this where it's not lined up on the spot it's supposed to start stitching since I jumped. What's gonna happen is it's gonna lower the presser foot and then it's gonna travel to where the next, the step is that I'm doing. To prevent it from accidentally catching this when it travels, I'm gonna hit the needle plus and just hit plus one. Now the machine, the needle is lined up where the first stitch is. Um, if I wouldn't have done that, it would have lowered the presser foot and traveled there and might have catch this and it starts stitching immediately. So little things like that help a lot within the hoop projects um, when you jump around steps like I was doing with the gold thread to prevent more thread changes. So now that I know this is in the right spot and everything's ready to go, I could lower the presser foot and now it's going to tack this piece down like so and now that's done and we're on the last step which we'll need our iron for again I forgot sorry sorry all right let me take this off all right let's go back to the craft table and the last step is the back but I forgot to prepare my back pieces. So let's do that. All right, so I'm gonna put this on the side. And these are my back pieces. So you're cutting two of the same size. I think on mine, it's like eight by 11 um, are the back pieces. But what we're gonna do 
is fold them wrong sides together. So we have something like this. So wrong sides together. And fold them in half, um, what do you call this, long ways. Um, and just give yourself a crease right here. Okay. So this just may this is the easy way of having a finished edge. If you're using a fabric on the back that like you're running low on and you want to save yourself a smidge, you can figure out that you might only need, you know, do the same trick with the heat and bond. And then you might only need like four and a half inches um, wide versus the eight inches wide that I'm using. So something like that could save you fabric, but this makes life a little bit easier just to fold it in half. So once you have these two, um, okay, wait, I'm looking at the thing and see if I did something wrong. Um, I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> Once you have that, then you are going to lay the piece, I'm saying the left-hand side, the folded edge going to the right down. You want to make sure this is your raw edge side, and you want to make sure it's covering this outer li uh, stitch line here, which I have in white, and I can see pretty well. So make sure that it's covering that and you're giving yourself, you know, a little bit of a quarter to a half inch going past it. Then you're gonna take your other folded piece, again, raw edge going to the outside, folded edge on top and going like this. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? If so, let me check. I think there's some talk going on in the chat about the top. Okay. What I showed you for the, um, the hanging piece, this is different than what is shown in the PDF instructions. The picture on the front is what I did. However, the picture on the inside, on the end, the hanging piece looks like this. So the instructions on the inside are, are similar in that we, we do the same thing with our side pieces, folding them in and finishing the sides. However, we don't fold it in half. She added some steam a seam on the end. So when we were ready to do that, uh, this stitch right here, this basting stitch, you see how I tacked it down to where it was folded in half. If you follow these instructions, you would tack it down open. Like so it would come down to here. So when you were done, you would wrap it around the back and your, what would happen is on the actual stand. So this accommodates a large, a longer, larger quilt to where the piece would go through the back, which you could still do with this. I could put some heat and bond light and tack this down to the back of my quilt when I'm done. And then the rod could still go through this little back hole on here and here. But it's just a different finished look um, than what I'm doing today because I like the, the hanging bit on the top. I think that's what everybody's talking about. Okay, any questions about the hanging bit or the back pieces, we're kind of creating an envelope here. Everything good with that? Where am I? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the machine and this is the last step. And it's basically gonna go around the whole outline of the mini quilt uh, a few times to secure the back onto it.
And again, it doesn't matter what thread color you use for this step. All right, Karen said, what is a good home embroidery show to go to, like a more hobby type quilting show? Um, I've been to two of them and they were both excellent. The um, applique getaway is very fun. It's located, it's always located in Dallas, Texas. Um, this year, it's gonna be like the last week of June and it's an in-person event for it starts like on a Friday evening. They have usually some like VIP classes on Friday. Sometimes I think they even started doing some special classes on the Thursday before. But then the main show is all day Saturday and Sunday. And um, there are classes all day. And then there's a vendor show in between the classes you can go to. So I taught last year like examples of classes um, were I taught placement, like how to figure out placement on a variety of different items before you stitch. I taught a class all about stabilizers and I taught a class all about applique. So those are three classes. They had classes on digitizing. Lisa Shaw goes there um, and she teaches classes. Um, the owner of Lenny Penny is Lindsay. She teaches classes on digitizing. Dawn has been there before and taught classes. Um, there are classes on in the hoop projects, classes, and then it's not just embroidery, it expands into sublimation, um, vinyl cutting, heat transfer vinyl. They even had laser information on uh, lasers like Glowforge and is it Epilogue? Um, so lots of crafting topics. Uh, that's one, so the first one was applique getaway. The other one, was Everything Embroidery Market. And that one changes its location every year. So it tries to get around mo mostly the Southeast. And this year, the show is in either March or April. And it's located in Biloxi, Mississippi. And again, same kind of format of all kind of classes you can take and then vendor shows where you can go shopping for all the cute supplies and blank items to embroider on. Really, really, really fun. Um, okay, so we are done. I took it out the hoop. And now I am going to cut right outside the stitch line and then trim my corners. So something like this. I never know my measurements maybe a quarter inch, half inch, something like that. And then when I get to the corner, corner I'm going to cut at a diagonal. You can also use some pinking shears for this step if you have some. And see, I wanted to ask too, for my friends that are here live today, um, we started at 1230 Central Time versus I normally do 1030 Central Time. Is this a better time for y'all or y'all like the earlier time? And it, it all depends on what time zone you are. Like I know Norma, who's in California time, that's 830 in the morning. So that would be like early. <laughs> <laughs> if I lived in California, that would be too early for me. Um, so let me know in the, the live chat for my friends that are watching um, how y'all like this time. Because this might be better maybe for me as well. The only thing is like normally right now, which we're finishing up, but I would normally leave to go get Elise off the bus in about five minutes. And we're almost done. But this project is a little bit longer than than normal and I talk a lot. Um, 
<laughs> but I'm just wondering about time wise because I'm always trying to figure out, you know, what what you can't please everybody, but you know, what works good for people. So I trim this, that's done. And then now you're just going to open this up and flip it right side out. And if you have like a wooden chopstick, that works good for getting these corners. Or if you have a, a bag turner, corner turner, you got to be careful with this one. I got to be careful with though, because the, the pointy end will sometimes go through the things, but that's the only part that gets the corners out. So I just got to be careful when I'm doing it. So just do that and then make sure my iron is still on. Actually, let me get my big iron. Okay, another survey question. <laughs> Who has an Ali, Aliso iron, like the big one? Who has one and is it worth the money? Because I am contemplating, I have a very old orc iron. That works. However, like I was ironing stuff earlier and it kept catching on things and wrinkling them. I don't know what I was doing wrong, but Tula Pink came out with a new one, did a collaboration with Ollie. So, and I just kind of just want it just because it's Tula Pink, <laughs> but I also want a new iron. So friends in the comments, please give me your, your honest opinion. If it's worth that very expensive iron because it's so pretty and it does the fancy thing where it lifts when you're not using it. All right. Um, okay. So once I turn my corners, then it's just now we're going to go and iron. Like I'm going to pull this seam right here and then iron this. And then I guess as a last step, if you really wanted, you can get a piece of heat and line bite, bond, uh, blah, blah, blah. heat and line bite. God, I can't talk. Heat and bond light, <laughs> like we did earlier, or the steam a seam, or the, the I even have the stick and peel, uh, peel and stick fabric tape you can use to close that hole if you want to. Okay. And then. Just roll it over and then make sure everything is nice and flat. All right. Uh, one thing I noticed, I did not do a great job. My, I think I lined it up crooked. I could see my hearts. They're getting smaller. <laughs> so it might go on there a little crooked. It might hang a little crooked. So yeah, I did a better job with this one. <laughs> this one goes straight across. This one, not so much. All right, so that's it. I got a few little thread tails I need to clean up on here. So one thing I found this machine to maybe I can adjust it, but I find that it keeps a tail coming out after it cuts and it moves to the next spot. Sometimes there's also the fact that I was stitching through several layers of stuff. So that might contribute as well because we had the stabilizer, the fusible fleece and the fabric. So it might've not just been pulling the tails through, but that's it guys. So like I said, you will take your stand and have your little hole and just kind of work it through this little gap right here.
and like that. Oops. And oopsie. That's my alarm telling me to go get Elise off the bus, but wrong camera. Okay. That's my alarm to tell me to get Elise off the bus, but she's not riding the bus today. All right. So this is what it looks like on the stand. Super cute. And like I said, Dawn has multiple different designs, the same kind of format, but the inside would be different um, that you can make. And so as the holidays and the seasons change, you can leave your stand up in your kitchen or on a shelf um, in your living room or in your entryway, and then just change out your mini quilt, you know, based on the holiday or the season. Really fun project. I love it. Now I'm going to go make all the holidays. And um, she said she might even make a Mardi Gras one for me. We'll see. So if she makes a Mardi Gras one, I might stitch it out and then I can have it. Unfortunately, here in Louisiana, Mardi Gras is February 13th and then Valentine's Day is the 14th. So they're right next door to each other. Um, but we can have all the decorations in the house. doesn't matter. I think she has one for St. Patty's Day. So that would be cute. That could be the next one we make. So yay. And oh yeah, Marina takes, makes a really good point. Super easy to store. You can get yourself even like one of those little shoebox containers and stack all of your mini quilts in it and then just grab the one um, to decorate with for that particular time. So yeah, nice and flat, easy to store. Get yourself a little container and keep them in. Easy to grab, change them out. So great, great point. Yay. Oh, great. Thank y'all so much. So glad, so glad. Um, I'm so glad y'all <laughs> y'all enjoy these um, tutorials and y'all deal with how slow that I am because <laughs> I got a comment the other day on my last tutorial saying that I talk too much. And so I am very aware that I talk too much and I'm grateful for y'all that watch me and enjoy my talkative slow process. <laughs> I always say that sometimes like I look at like the stitch time on this project is only 12 minutes, but I'm going to turn it into an hour and a half project because that's what I do. <laughs> but once you watch and you go through it, like if I was in here and just making something for someone, you know, I'll, I'll zip through it. But because, you know, we like to talk it out, we like to talk about um, different scenarios of things that can happen while you're stitching or different ways that you can make something, um, you know, it gives us more insight. So yay. All right. I'm just checking the comments. Okay. I'm going to go back and look after the live's over. I'm going to go back and look at what y'all said about the time, whether you like 1030 um, central time in the morning or 1230 central time, more like lunch afternoon-ish. Um, and then I'm also going to go look and see what y'all say about the iron because I really think I need one. Oh, Dawn got one. Um, Reliable is a good brand too, but pricey too. Yeah, they're all pricey. But, uh, oh, Norma had both and she gave them away. Why you didn't call me, Norma? <laughs> um, oh, let's see. Len, Len's design sounds like me. She's, she's got the cheapest iron from Walmart. Uh, she got it 19 years ago when she got married and she's still using it. That's awesome. They don't make things like they used to though. So my iron, I got when I got married, my, my mother-in-law got me a vacuum as our wedding present and that iron came with it. So that iron is 15 years old. It still works. Um, awesome. Okay. All right. I'm just checking all the comments. <laughs> oh, hello. Diana, you're my favorite person today. Oh my God. It'd be so boring if we didn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Annette. Thank you, thank you. All right. Oh, Christy's like, I've bought so many irons. <laughs> I forgot, so I got three. I just got that little mini one that I apparently need to turn in, and my Cricut and my Oric. Um, so, all right, guys, that is it for today. Let me look. I've been trying to do better about planning. My next, I put it on the Sip and Stitch homepage, my schedule until May. So February, 
is going to be Friday, February 23rd. So for me, that's going to be the week after Mardi Gras, because I think we might go on vacation the week of Mardi Gras. So the week after that, that Friday, we will have Sip and Stitch. And then after I kind of gauge what people are liking for time and what's going on that day, I'll tell you whether it'll be 1030 or 1230. Um, and then I have March, April, and May, some tentative dates on there as well um, on when our Sip and Stitches will be. Uh, for February, I haven't decided what the project's going to be yet. Um, probably something St. Patty's or Easter related, maybe. Um, but I will let you know when I figure it out. As always, if you ever have any recommendations or suggestions of things you would like to see, um, if you even if you're like scrolling on Facebook or Etsy and you see someone post something, you're like, I want to learn how to make that. Send it to me. Send me the link or the picture of what you see, and I will um, figure it out, and we'll see if we can make a, a tutorial for you. But I always love getting y'all suggestions, because sometimes I think I'm like, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> so uh, there's so many things I want to do is the problem, so I don't know what to do next. So y'all tell me what y'all want to see. Um, but that is it for today. Remember, you can go and grab this design along with any other design from Creative Appliques um, using the coupon code CARLY, K-A-R-L-I-E, is gonna get you 20% off your entire purchase. And that coupon is good through February 14th, 2024. So go fill up your cart, get your year's worth of mini quilts, um, and then have them in a little box and you can change them out as the year goes along. Or you can also look at all of Dawn's other um, awesome designs that she has on her site, especially the fonts. Go check out the font section. Um, let's see, what else? I think, oh, if you are in my VIP membership group, so I have a special monthly membership group where we do a Zoom class once a month, and I give them a free embroidery design every month. We will be having that class next Wednesday, January 31st. Um, and the class is going to be on what the free design is that month, which is going to be an in the hoop heart stuff animal or stuffy. So that's what we're going to be doing in our VIP membership group. Um, if you're already a member, stay tuned to our member portal and the private Facebook group for all the information on that project. If you're not in the VIP group and interested, um, the really cool thing about it is we get those monthly classes together. And you get access to everything that we've done in the past. So we're hitting our three-year anniversary um, in April of having this um, Sip and Stitch Squad VIP membership group. And so you will get access to all of our classes since April of 2020. No, 2021. Um, and also all of the embroidery designs I've given over the past three years as well. So there's a plethora of fun stuff in the library, um, in the VIP membership group. And it's only $9 a month. Um, so it's not a bad deal. You get a Zoom class and a free design and access to all of the, the library as well. So if you want to come join us before next Wednesday and you can learn how to make a heart stuffy, it's going to be a lot of fun. And other than that, stay tuned for my In Brilliance Essentials um, online course should be coming out next month fingers crossed <laughs> that I sit down and, and finish it. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate y'all. I'm sorry again for the time mixed up for the, those of you that y'all watched live. If you're watching the replay later on, leave me some comments. Let me know um, if you have any questions about today, today's class or if you have any suggestions about anything. So thanks again. And I will see y'all next time. All right. Bye guys.